Please have a seat, folks. Thank you, worship team. Awesome stuff. I just need to also say happy Queensland Day to you, the day that our forefathers set aside breaking away from the tyranny and injustice of New South Wales, <laughs> finding our supremacy north of the border, which will be validated on Wednesday night, I'm sure, to a certain extent, perhaps. Yeah, no, 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 no. We pray for those who have the understanding of the um, New South Wales side. <laughs> Folks, we've been on this journey for a week now. And it's just been such a challenge. I've found some great little pearls of wisdom come up in the daily devotions that I just think are great. And I've shared them with folk and I've sent them to people in other churches and I've sent to another, a couple in another Baptist church that are friends, dear friends of ours. And, and I said, oh, if you've been reading this, this day five is just awesome. It's Ephesians and it talks about loving God. And she said, what are you talking about? And I said, isn't your church doing this? She said, no. Nah. I said, oh, okay, 200 and... 19 churches are doing it in the Baptist Union. I said 220 last week. So she asked me for the link, so I sent it to her, some encouragement there. But yeah, just the stuff that's been coming out. Because last week we, I spoke about, God got me to speak about awakening in prayer. Is it rekindling, revitalizing what's happening in our lives? And, and being part of the prayer teams that have been involved in, the war rooms have been involved in during the week, just been some great stuff that's just been popping out that God has been doing with individuals as well as collectively as a church. Today, we're praying for, for not only revival, but we're doing it, we're looking at that whole understanding of interceding in others because sometimes we just say, what's the point? What's the point in prayer? Is it going to really make a difference? We throw our heart out to God and we think he's silent. We think, well, what's going on? There's an incident that happened in the life of the church, an episode of Acts Church and Acts 12 that we're going to look at today that I pray will be an encouragement to you and also talk to you about what it means to be uh, constantly in prayer with God. As we're reading through Acts, actually, I might pray now. I'm just going to pray later. I might pray now. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, just to be able to sing the songs we've sung this morning about just connecting you. Lord, the time we spent in prayer already has been great. Father, we pray as we open your word today. Father, as we look at the church in Acts and, and Father, this episode that happens, that, Lord, you will highlight to each person here, Lord, their role with you, their personal connection with you. Father, too many times we sit in the third person. We sit in the, at, as God's eye, so to speak, and we look down into the situation and we pray with, mo with plural pronouns, we this and we, we should. Father, we want to make it about, Lord, I am, I need. Lord, what are you saying to me today? Father, I pray that truth into each person's life here today. Lord, you're good and gracious, God. Father, you, you meet us right where we are. Father, that little, little piece of our faith that's there, no matter how small, Lord, you meet us right there and help us to grow. And Father, as we look at interceding, intercession prayer, intercessionary prayer, interceding for others, Father, I just pray you do a work in us today. Oh, we thank you for your blessing. Lord, and as always, I pray. Uh, the words I speak of your words, not mine. Amen. In the end of Acts 11, the church is going off like a skyrocket. A friend of mine used to say, going off like a frog in a sock. The spread of the gospel was increasing. The church had been through the martyrdom. They'd been through Stephen being killed, and they dispersed, dispersed themselves around, and people are praying, and house churches are sitting up. And it's been a quite exciting time in the church. The movement's gaining momentum. It says in Acts 11 that in Antioch they were first called Christians. They actually had a name they could wear on their tunic or wear on their robe or whatever it was they had, and they lived their life for God. And it says in Scripture that people were coming together in faith. That these, In those two verses it says, wherever they preached, people came to God. So the kingdom is expanding. So as with everything else, when the kingdom is starting to do stuff and God's kingdom is starting to get a roll on, who raises his ugly head and says, no way, Buck? The evil one, Satan. And he says, I don't want you to be rejoicing. I don't want you to have positive aspects. I don't want you to think that, yes, this is going well. I want you to doubt yourself. I want you to be defeated. I want you to be constricted. This is happening as we go into verse 12. 
I had a mental picture then of riding along on a push bike. Ever when we were kids, we used to coast down the hill on a push bike. Those were the days. Didn't have to wear helmets. In the 70s and 80s, it was awesome fun. Some of us have got the scars to prove it. Some of us have got the mental disabilities to prove it. We're going down the hill, and we used to love this hill in Petrie. We used to get to the top of the hill, and we used to dare each other to see how far we could coast without touching the brakes. And Bruce Highway is at the bottom of the hill, <laughs> the main artery at those days before it went past Petrie. And we'd take off, and we'd go like cut cats down this hill and just let the wind go through our hair. And I had long hair in those days. The wind go through our hair as we went down. Then we look at each other sideways, see who's going to break first, who's going to break first. And there was one little part if you got to this point where the gutter was smooth and you could sort of get into the driveway and you could sort of leap off this and then go around the corner. Where am I going with the illustration? Every now and then, as we're coasting freely, as we're going down, enjoying the experience, there's a possibility that someone will put a spoke through the a stick through the spokes straight over the handlebars and we come crashing down. That's what Satan wants to do with this prayer movement. That's what Satan wants to do in our lives. He doesn't want us to be victorious. He doesn't want us to see the positive things. He wants to put a spoke in the works, a stick in the spokes. Sorry. And so we have this situation where Herod, Satan is using Herod here, and Herod's a king who thinks he's pretty cool. And because the church is doing great things, the famine support was organised and increased. We read about that, all that in Acts 11. So things are going well. And then we come to, ver to chapter 12. It was about this time. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And when he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. It was about this time. We ask, is this a coincidence? We don't think so. This wasn't an accident. This was something that happened in the life of the church. Things were going well, and Herod was looking around thinking, I could lose my power base here because I'm a pretty powerful king, and I want to do something about this. Because Herod, like most people, craved that, that uh, he craved validation, he craved power, he craved relevance. And that's something that happens in our society today is that people try to be relevant to the point almost where they deny that they are a male or a female just so they can be relevant. They're taught that now. We were speaking about this yesterday morning at the prayer meeting about how the Act is going through Parliament to deny families and people and families their true identity and how in Victoria it's already been passed that if a child who has gender dysphoria issues goes to their parent and asks them to pray and that parent prays for that child, the government will arrest you and put you in jail. This is what's happened. This is the spoke that's going to the works in our society. And so much for relevance that people will sometimes deny their faith in Jesus. Herod was just, he was just overcome with what was happening. And in his thinking and his understanding is the church should know its place. We need to put these people in place. We need to make sure they don't have an ascendancy. They don't have any power. I'm going to take the power from them. I'm going to defeat them. I'm going to start persecuting them. I'm going to start killing them. And when that happens, they'll see the error of their ways. In verse 2, it says that the execution of James. James is put to death. Stephen was being put to death in chapter 6. Oh sorry, chapter 9. And then here we have... James put to the sword. I always wonder, you know, about 21st century, 1st century church. <laughs> How we'd go if we had to live in a persecution society. How we'd really go. How would we function? Would we underground or would we walk away? We shared this morning out of the Revelation Church, Laodicea. You know, we can stand in history and say, well, Laodicea, well actually it's in the future, Laodicea is a church that was lukewarm. It was either hot nor cold. But I wonder what was going on in that church to, let, to, to that be their witness. What was going on in the life of the believers in that church? Were they under enormous pressure from their workplace? Were they under enormous pressure from society? Did they lose their first love because of what was happening around them? And we come to this point then where the church is suffering from physical and spiritual bondage. It's being pulled and torn into places it doesn't want to be. Folks, that last phrase, if you want to use that term, is what we're dealing with today. It's physical and spiritual bondage. That's why we're interceding in prayer. 
That's why we're jumping into this prayer. That's why we're pressing into this understanding today. I believe this is God's message for us today because this church didn't give up. They didn't say, well, woe is us, it's not going to happen. Woe is the individual, it's not going to happen. This church didn't give up. There's a couple of things. There's four things that this church did we're going to reflect on as we read through Acts 12. We're starting off in verse 5. Let's have a look at verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying for God to God for him. The church was earnestly praying. The church didn't meet and go, oh, okay, oh, oh yeah, okay, we've got to pray. They actually earnestly pray, it says in the Word. See, the church, the only power the church had was the power of prayer left. They couldn't raise an army. They couldn't take weapons. They couldn't go and beat up the guards. They couldn't go and overthrow Herod. But they had the power of prayer. And when you have the power of prayer, you have a special weapon. A special weapon indeed. The word earnest there is the same word that's used in, in Gethsemane. When Jesus was going up and it said he prayed earnestly, it's the same Greek word. It's the same intensity. It's the same power. It's the same fervency. It's the same heart cry. And we know what Jesus prayed, didn't we? He prayed that until all drops of blood came. That's what his sweat was like. So the church engaged in prayer. This church, bless them, they said, no, we're not going to be defeated. See, when we pray earnestly, we f when we care about people, we know that God cares too. You pray earnestly when you care and you believe that God cares about the situation. And we did a little bit of that today. We s got in our, our, our groups and we prayed for the other person to have revival. We prayed into their situation. We interceded bef into them. We didn't pray, Lord, help me. We didn't pray, Lord, help the church. We prayed, Lord, this person on my left, Lord, I want you to let them feel a touch of your spirit today in a freshness and renewal. Lord, we don't know their situation. If we know their situation, we want to pray against that as well. And that's what the church did. It went out of its way. It, it got together. It became earnest prayers. It became fair dinkum. And the question arises, and we've already done it this morning, but on a grander scale, I suppose, is that what and who are you praying for? We've been asked to pray for 21 days. How's that going? Is anyone keeping a journal for the 21 days? Anyone journaling? Thanks, Mac. Well, you and I, Mac, are the only ones. I've, I don't usually journal when I pray, but I'm praying and using a journal this time. Great little truths are coming out. I'm going to reflect upon that in times to come. But it helps us to say, well, who are we praying for? What situation are we praying for? If we're earnestly praying, or are we just meeting like we do every week? Can I implore you, take this challenge to invest in this wholeheartedly. To step out of your comfort zone a little bit. To really pour your heart out to God and say, Lord, I, I've been praying all my Christian life, but I just want to do a little bit deep in this time. I want to be a place where you want me to be. Don't just make it something you tick on a box. I held up the prayer rooms before. I'm not going to ask you to come up here in three weeks' time and say, okay, show and tell who got the most ticks and went to the most prayer rooms. If you make it to one in three weeks, make it wholeheartedly. If you make it to many of them, make them wholeheartedly. But please make an effort to pray earnestly. This reflects the kingdom of God and reflects several other things we have as well. In verses 6 and 8, we go to the next part. And a little bit of verse 12. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, both bound in two chains and sentries and good at the entrance. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and the light shone in his cell. And he struck Peter on the side and he said, wake up, get up quick. And he said that. And, he, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on some clothes. Put on some clothes and your sandals. And, and Peter did so. And in verse 12, when, this, when it had dawned on him that he went... He went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered. The outcome of the prayer of the people, when they saw their brothers go and be taken to jail, the outcome of what they did was they interceded in their behalf. They got together and they prayed. Not only did they pray earnestly, they prayed endlessly. And the outcome was miraculous. The outcome was spiritual. There were some things happening. You read through that for some unknown reason, 
to others than we know what happened, but you know, people of the time were saying that the, 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 the process is that when someone's in change and it says four by four, you have two people in the cell with him chained up to him, one each side, you have two people outside. The angel came in and kicked him in the gut ribs and said, get up, Peter, time to get dressed, laying naked in a jail between two men. Mm, a bit dodgy. And he got up and he got dressed and his chains were gone. The guards were still asleep. The door was open. He kept walking. The two guards outside were asleep. He kept walking. And he walked like he said he was in a vision or a dream until he got outside. Then he realised, whoa, hey, this wasn't a dream. I'm actually really here. And then he went to Mary's house. All the time, the people were praying. All the time. They didn't just have a 10-minute prayer time. They met together and they endlessly prayed. Because it says in verse 5 they prayed, then it says in verse 12 they were praying together. All the people were there praying. They were praying together endlessly. They were continuously praying for God to move in his life. They were interceding on behalf of someone in a terrible situation, interceding on behalf of someone who needed a touch from God, needed encouragement from God, needed God's presence in their life. The key to this is you pray until something happens. Now we've put a 21 day sort of you know boundary, I suppose, on our prayer. Can I encourage you, let this be the start of something bigger. Let it go more than 21 days, just let it keep going. That God might light a fire in your life about this. But pray until something happens. The old band that used to have around, they had WWJD, what would Jesus do? And then they come out with FROG, forever relied on God. And then there was push, pray, pray until something happens. I used to wear this little thing just to make you a reminder. I couldn't find one. I thought I had one at home. But we need to be continually in prayer, endlessly in prayer. Jesus taught a lesson about perseverance in prayer in Luke 8, in 1. And it's, it's the, prayer, the parable of the persistent widow. And the story is that, is that there was this rich person and this widow, and it was like a judge he was, he was a high-placed authority, and this widow kept coming for justice to him, and she kept coming and trying, pleading with him over and over again. In the end, he just says these words. And it says in verse 6, he said, And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? You see, that judge just kept saying, go away, go away, you bother me. You're so annoying. But she kept persisting. She kept persisting until he finally said, this annoying woman, just give her whatever she needs. How much more does our Heavenly Father love us? And if Jesus has set these words up, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them what they should how they should always pray and not give up. That's what it says in, in Luke 18, 1. Pray and don't give up. Be endless in prayer. Keep pushing until something happens. Keep staying close to God. And it got me thinking about how strong is your prayer engine? How strong is your prayer engine? Does it have uh, this vitality that keeps on going or is it just like a little lawnmower? That da -da 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 We used to joke, there's a friend of ours, he had a, one of those little Honda, Honda um, cars it was a two-door one and it had a 300cc motor in it, like a glorified sewing machine. And he used to drive it to church anyway. It was a really Kermit green colour as well, so it stood out in the parking lot like, say, you know, do something to me. So the young men in the church, not myself, the young men in the church picked up Neil's car and carried it somewhere and hid it from him. A little tiny motor in this little tiny car. Then there was another guy in the church and he had a V8 and he had this, it was a GDHO, phase two GDHO, this young man. He was like 18, he had this car. He'd raced, ra he'd raced carts as a young man, so he knew how to race cars. And it was the great, talk about youth group, workplace health and safety. Every time we went on an outing, I used to get a list of parents, give me, my child cannot go with this person. <laughs> he used to come into the church park and then he'd rev it and turn it off. He'd come in church and he'd praise God, a really great man of God, but he loved this car. And people were saying, no, how strong is your prayer engine? You know, does it keep functioning? Does it keep just putting over and over and over? Or is it just, you know, is it sort of being leaned out too much and then it's, it starts to splutter? How strong is your prayer engine? God answers prayer in unexpected ways. We've got to understand that, that sometimes it's not how we want him to. And these guys, they just hunkered down for prayer, endlessly praying and praying and praying, saying, Lord, just, you know, intercede on our behalf. We want to intercede on behalf of Peter, Lord, intercede on our behalf. And as they were doing that, things happened, but it happened in God's way, in the unexpected way. 
The other thing that happened with these people, and this is just like, you know, we look at this incident and we go, wow, there was unity in this church. And it's called a church now, okay? It's not a home group, it's a church. And in the first century, this is what churches looked like. There were people who gathered together. And when we read into the social context of this church, it's, it's quite amazing in 12 and 13. Uh, it says here, And when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked on the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Ro Rhoda came to answer the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back and without even opening it, exclaimed, Peter is at the door. Mary's house was not a little bungalow attached to something. It was just a mud brick place. It actually had a courtyard and a foyer, which speaks of opulence, of financial wealth. And everyone was gathered there. And it got me thinking, so I read into a little bit. And the understanding of the time is that God actually used every person in that church group, no matter where they sat in society, as a prayer weapon. It didn't matter if they were rich or poor or where they come from, Gentile or Jew, if they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, their prayers were worthy. And he drew them together in this sense of unity. And sometimes we think, well, church should look like this or, uh, you know, we should only be a certain way. Church takes everybody. The church consists of every person who loves God. If your faith is small and if your faith is great, if you're the pastor or if you're a person who it just comes once a week, it doesn't matter. The church is there for everybody. And there's diversity in that, in that regard. There's, there's no hierarchy. There's no status. There's, there's just this understanding that people are coming together in unity. There's no discrimination in prayer. God hears everyone's prayer. Did you know that? When I was a young man at Caboolture Church, we had this guy called Harry Marks, who's a Scot, much like Frank. And I think they could have been brothers because they're both very frugal. Anyway. When Harry prayed, you could see heaven open. I'm sure of it. And every <laughs> and we used to say, we used to sit there and have corporate prayer in church and then we'd be, some of us would be praying and all of a sudden Harry would start praying. And oh, it was just music to your ears. You thought, oh man. And someone made the comment one day, well, I'm never going to pray after Harry because my prayer sounds pretty ordinary. So everyone should try and get in front of Harry to pray. And Harry got to the point one day where someone said, Harry, will you lead us in prayer? And he said, why? Well, because you pray really good. And Harry said, everyone in this group prays really good. He said, I want someone else to pray. He's a humble man of God. So it doesn't matter. We pray as God leads our heart. We pray with what we have. Prayer is the unifying weapon wielded by the faithful. In this case, it went against what was happening in the public realm. In this case, it happened that it went against the laws of physics and nature. But it was a weapon wielded. If we understand that prayer is the weapon wielded by the faithful, then what happens? We wield our weapon. We pray together. We become unified in prayer. It's been so encouraging to have so many people put their hands up all around the place saying, I'm going to go to this one or I'll host this one or I'll do this or I'll do that because people want to be part of it. And that should be an encouragement. You're given 21 places where you could pray at least once. Thank the Lord that he is moving in people's lives. We encourage you with that. Matthew 18 and verse 20. It talks about this, this understanding about getting together for the kingdom purpose. For the kingdom purpose, I add. And it says this, Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And then it says these words in verse 20. For where two or three gather in my name, for my purpose, for my reasons, for whatever that ministry is, that's my name, there I am with them. When two or three gather in my name. Wow. Jesus said those words to encourage the disciples and anyone who's listening in his area of view of his earshot of him. He's saying, just get together. There's unity in it. There's power in it. And he got this church together and they're all from all different walks of society and in that part of the world in the first century church. It was hosted by this lady. And so we have this understanding that just 
spirit was there. And then we have an unusual thing that happens. The young lady leaves the front gate, forgets to let Peter in. Whether she thought it was Peter or whether she thought it was an apparition or something, we're not sure. And then she runs into and tells them what's happening. She runs in and she says excitedly, Peter's here, Peter's here, Peter's here. And what is the response? Thank you, Lord, for answered prayer. Thank you, Lord, that Peter has been delivered. Oh, thank goodness, Lord, you've come through for us. The answer was, are you out of your mind? Are you out of your mind? What do you, what do you mean he's here? It can't be him. Isn't it funny how they were praying and their hearts were going into it? And yet this very human response happens from time to time. Are you out of your mind? And I read that and I had a bit of a chuckle because that's sometimes how I see things. I pray, Lord, I want, please, Lord, you know, <laughs> please go with me on this one or show me something here. And then, I s then he reveals and I go, yeah, that's not quite what I was expecting. The lesson here is that come expectantly into the throne room of grace. Come expectantly into it. The Lord will answer your prayer. He answers it the way he wills. He answers the way, he, the way that he sees best. He reveals himself in the circumstances that bring glory to the kingdom. In, in Hebrews 4.16, it says, Let us approach God's grace, God's throne of grace, with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace that helps us in our time of need. Wow. When that was written, it must have been a revelation. Come into the house, into the throne room of grace. Come expectly in there to hear from God, to see God, to be touched by God. One of the things that we have in expectant prayer, and sometimes we think, well, you know, it says in the Bible, if I pray this, it will happen, or I need to pray this. But I just want to let you know of a truth from Scripture, and that is that God sets the cause in your heart. God sets the cause in your heart. If you're praying for personal renewal, God's already set that course there. He says, you need to pray. And as we pray, he meets us. He meets us where we are. And he walks with us from that point on. God sets the cause in your heart. If you've been overwhelmed with something that's happening in Chiang Mai in the orphanage and you heard a word shared by Terry and Rob last week, then you say, oh, Lord, that just hits me right here. Then that's God setting the cause in your heart. If you look around the congregation, you see someone and God just says to you, that person needs prayer. That's the cause God sets in your heart. You don't even need to go up to them sometimes. You just need to say, Lord, I just want to lift them up before you. God sets the cause in your heart. It's not about us telling God, and that's why we're not talking about petition in prayer now and asking for things. We're talking about intercession because he intercedes before us. It says that in Romans, the spirit intercedes with groans that we cannot express. God sets that a cause in our heart. In James 5.16, prayer has value. Therefore, confess, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And these are the words that I want to just to reflect upon. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and, and effective. Now we might say, well, I'm not righteous, so therefore my prayers aren't worthy. We have an opportunity daily to get ourselves right with God. And that's what that word righteous means, a person who gets close to God. We're not asking for someone to come up here and preach a 20-minute sermon or a half-hour sermon on prayer. We're not asking you to go out in the main street and declare before everyone else. Just have to do it with God. Say, Lord, I just need to set things right with you. Lord, I need you to speak into my life. Father, meet me where I am so that I might grow in you. Step by step, brick by brick. Because we believe that, and we believe that has an impact on the kingdom, and that's what it's about. Revival, 21 days of prayer for revival in our churches and in our region. 21 days where I asked you last week to write down the names of people on those cards that we had sitting on the table, on the chairs, of people that you believe needed prayer. Not because they were un not worthy of you, but you just, God calls to your heart to say, I want to pray for that person. You know, I had trouble keeping it to two people, I've got to admit that. I've worked with a lot of sinners and... Um, and say, God was inundating me with people to pray for. And I'm going, oh, Lord, which ones? There's got to be one more important than the other. No, no one laughed. Okay. Um, intercessory prayer is about the kingdom. Worship team, if you'd like to come up. Um, we're just going to finish this last slide and then we're going to pray.
the key factor to remember in intercessory prayer is bring the cause of others before him. Just bring the cause to him. Just bring that into his feet, into the frame and leave it at God's feet. Can I encourage you with that? It's about believing that our sovereign God walk, works all things together for good as we pray. The outcome may not be what we expect, but it'll be for the good that he purposes. We've got to believe that and we've got to grasp onto that. When a church play, prays together and earnestly and expectedly, the word of God spreads. And that's what we're about. Not about us being okay. Phew, I'm glad I've got the box ticked. As we pray, as we engage in God, as we intercede on those who don't know Jesus, is that others will be impacted by that, that they will have a leading from the Spirit. And what's this about? All of a sudden, I'm thinking about God. I know a Christian. I know a person who goes to church. I know a God botherer. I know someone who annoys me all the time. Talking about Jesus, I'll ask them the answer. When the church prays together earnestly and expectantly, the word of God spreads and the lost get saved. And that's basically the bottom line, is the lost get saved. We're going to finish with the song what we sang just before I got up to speak. And the breath of God in our lungs. I pray that this week that you'll receive the breath of God in your lungs better speak the truth into people's lives. That part of that breath will be expelled in prayer of intercession. To be able to say, Lord, I need to pray for this person. You've just laid them on my heart. I want to pray for them. So that they may be impacted in the kingdom. Paul wrote to Timothy and he had these words to say. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and for all those in authority. That they may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Saviour. This is why it pleases God, who wants all people to be saved and to be come into the knowledge and truth of the kingdom of heaven. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that this church in Acts, this group of people, uh, these, Lord, these few that got together and prayed, Lord, teach us so much today. Father, we thank you that you speak through them to us. Lord, challenge us on all different levels. Father, we don't sometimes get it right. We know that. Lord, we rely on you to help us there. Father, I pray for each person here today as they go into this next week, Father, this next week of just thinking about intercession. Father, you cracked upon our lives, people we can pray for in a very real way. Lord, circumstances or life choices, whatever it is, Lord, just touch us and give us a prompt. Lord, we might share a Bible verse. Father, we might just share a prayer. We might just text praying for you. Father, we just thank you that that reflects the kingdom and the heart that you've called us to. Lord, I thank you for Jesus who died on the cross for us, that we may have eternal life and, Lord, live life to the full because of you. And, Lord, we thank you for that. And, Lord, we pray that your breath will fill our lungs. Lord, we sing your breath will fill our lungs.